Good afternoon and welcome to this live broadcast being brought to you by ZTN in partnership with uh, ZNCWC where we're talking about children's safety and welfare in, under COVID-19. Zimbabwe, like all countries around the world, has been affected by this pandemic with over 300 people to date being infected and at least four deaths having been recorded. The government has instituted, instituted lockdowns uh, across the country since March 30 to curtail the spread of this disease. This has seen schools and institutions of learning being closed and movement being restricted amongst other issues. Children being a vulnerable group have their own unit. I'm Takuchi Mbakwe and I'll be your host this afternoon. Joining me in the guests are esteemed panelists who I'm going to quickly ask to introduce themselves and which organization they're coming from. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Ma Thank you. Um, my name is Barbara Nyangairi. I am from Dev Zimbabwe Trust. Dev Zimbabwe Trust is an organization that supports children with disabilities, particularly the deaf. And our focus areas are education, sign language, and disability rights. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm Reverend Tela Nyanente. Mm -hmm. I'm the National Director with Zimbabwe National Council for the Welfare of Children. And basically, uh, ZNCWC is an umbrella board of the child rights sector. Mm -hmm. And our work is around coordinating and creating platforms for discussion of issues of children and one platform is the one we are having now mm -hmm. um, and we also advocate uh, for children's rights um, with policy makers as well as ensure that the states um, meets the obligations that it is ratified within the uh, treaty bodies All right. the African Charter the UNCRC that's quite a mouthful there. Plus, you're reverend as well. Yeah. Yes, there's a lot of governance on your shoulders. <laughs> and to you, sir. Thanks, Taku. Yeah. Uh, my name is Samo Manduana. Mm -hmm. I'm the Child Rights uh, Protection and Safeguarding Technical Lead with uh, Plan International Zimbabwe. And uh, Plan International is an international uh, development and humanitarian organization that thrives for the fulfillment of children's rights and um, equality for, for girls. Mm -hmm. And um, in Zimbabwe, we, we have a new strategy that was born in 2019 that focuses on four key program areas, which are sexual and reproductive health rights. We will focus on transformative gender uh, child protection. We also focus on inclusive child uh, education for, mm -hmm. for children. And lastly, youth economic empowerment. All right. Thank you so much. We'll start with you, uh, Samuel, uh, because they say that the last shall be the first. So if we start this discussion, tell us what your views are regards uh, children and COVID-19. What specific risks uh, have children faced uh, or been exposed to in during this uh, lockdown period and since this pandemic started here in Zimbabwe? Yeah, you, probably someone who is uh, uh, more into issues of child protection. Uh, we, we, we have seen a, a lot of child protection risks that emerged due to, to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we are under lockdown and uh, there are restrictions in terms of movements. Uh, key service uh, providers, in particular on child protection, some have closed, some are operating at a very minimal uh, uh, level. So in terms of uh, children, uh, they are confined, the usual activities are limited. Mm -hmm. So they are encountering uh, a, a various uh, cases of violence and, and abuse. And among some of the issues that, that are coming from children that we work with, they're exposed to sexual abuse, they're being exposed to physical abuse, uh, emotional abuse, neglect at some point, and also issues to do with um, sexual exploitation. Mm -hmm. So children are encountering a variety of uh, violence and abuse uh, during lockdown. Mm -hmm. And also remember they, they are not in, in school and the school environment is uh, a safe haven for children. Mm -hmm. They also feel safe when they are at school. And also given that, you know, uh, being in lockdown with, with parents, it also comes with certain stressors, issues of domestic violence also emerge mm -hmm. that uh, also lead to continuous abuse of, of children. So children are faced with uh, numerous kind of, uh, of abuses 
and it's difficult for them to, to actually report and reach out to service providers who have got a mandate of responding to, to child abuse cases. Mm -hmm. Good examples could be, while at least they are required probably to reach out to the victim friendly unit, what happens if they can, if the VFU system is beyond the five kilometer radius that is required for them to, to move? What happens if we have, uh, you know, security forces not allowing anyone to just move at, at will? Mm -hmm. So all this uh, uh, is affecting uh, the wealth of children, in particular the rights of children okay. to protection from various forms of violence and, and abuse. All right, thank you for that informed input there. Coming to you, Barbara, he's highlighting issues of uh, violence uh, that are coming out uh, since uh, this lockdown was instituted. What are you picking from Deaf Zimbabwe Trust dealing with these children that are already vulnerable in society? Thank you. Children with disabilities have been um, rather invisible mm -hmm. in, in most of our, our, our communities. Mm -hmm. And so you'd find that even when you're looking at families in terms of status, children with disabilities have the least status in the home. And because of that, they are vulnerable to mental health challenges. S talk, for example, of deaf children. 90% of children who are deaf are born to hearing parents who do not know how to communicate with them. Mm. And we've realized that the lack of communication in the home is very intentional. It's parents who have not accepted that their child is deaf and that their child communicates in a different way mm. than they do. And they have not desired to master the way in which their child communicates. So you find that most of the uh, communication in the home for children with disabilities is very instructional. Come here, go there, you're hungry, get food. There is no fellowship. So children with disabilities, especially who are deaf, the school, as, as, as Samuel said, provides a space where they meet friends, where they can talk, and when somebody can understand, understand them. Mm -hmm. But now they're in the home with parents, siblings, mm -hmm. guardians, who don't know how to talk to them. Okay. The loneliness. So, so what, what needs to be done, or what are some of the solutions? Because if these issues you're saying are actually happening, what then happens to the children? Do they have somewhere to run to? What are you doing to create that environment where they can run to and be safe? Unfortunately, with the lockdown, mm -hmm. they are stuck with their families that don't know how to talk to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have had parents come to us and say, my daughter, my son is just sleeping the whole day. They're not getting out of bed. Mm -hmm. That's a sign of depression. So the mental health issues that children are facing right now, especially those that don't have the abilities to communicate with family. I mean, imagine you're in a place where nobody's able to talk to you. Mm -hmm. They can watch TV. They can, you know... Um, listen to the radio, they have other forms of entertainment, mm -hmm. but they can't talk to you in the way that they're talking with others. That in itself is a stressor. Mm. Okay, I'm just going to cut you short there and come to the Reverend here. Before you come in, according to Chanline Zimbabwe, during the lockdown month of April, they received over 95,000 child-related distress calls, which is a 20 percent, 23% rise from the norm. And picking from what... Uh, Nelson has said, and what Barbara has said, you can tell that we have a big task on our hands as a nation to deal with the children. As you were saying earlier, they're always the people that are always put on the tail end. Everyone is focusing on the adults. What then should we do? Yeah, um, there are quite a number of strategies. Mm -hmm. But what is important is to ensure that children have basic needs. Mm -hmm. And one of them is the right to food, which is impeded during COVID because quite a number of uh, uh, families or parents are unable to work within the informal sector. Mm -hmm. which is which employs the majority of people in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. So food security is also a challenge. Um, but we know government has gone out of its way to try and um, mitigate by providing cash transfers and also issuance of uh, food handouts. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is never enough uh, in, under the circumstances. We also... Um, know that children are very exper experimental. Mm -hmm. 
they want to explore the environment and now limiting them in terms of keeping them within the house limit is a challenge mm -hmm. and hence the distress calls that you're talking to mm -hmm. uh, that are coming through to to child line mm -hmm. it's because children are limited in terms of their functionality and they end up uh, experiencing violence within the family setup okay yeah staying with you Riv. The, the one of the rights of children is right to education yeah and right now schools are closed and they're being deprived of that basic right there and we've now heard of a system where children have to start learning online and yet a lot of other st uh, students cannot afford the I internet service uh, costs as well as the gadgets that are needed for one to start uh, surfing on the internet and, and, and learning. So what, what, are you, what are your suggestions and what are some of the issues that you're picking from society? Yeah, the issue of education, um, it has been disrupted very much. Mm. And um, I certainly believe that government is seized with the matter and hence their indication that they might try and open, although they have lost a whole term mm. for children. They are trying to make an effort to open. Um, but then uh, online education is only for people maybe in the urban areas, but those with gadgets. Mm. The majority in the rural areas, they have no access to internet, uh, and it will become very difficult. Although there is an effort to provide gadgets that the people can learn through mm -hmm. radios or um, other audios, but surely education has been disrupted and it will take some time to get back uh, to the levels that we were. Um, but then COVID-19 is not going to, is, uh, is, is around for some time. So we need to develop new strategies mm -hmm. to cope with that. And I think the effort to try and reopen schools uh, is a good initiative, but it has to come with the requirements, the whole guidelines mm -hmm. uh, on safety and health. Okay. And that uh, is the big challenge. I'm going to have to cut you there. Coming to you quickly, what measures are the parents supposed to take to ensure that uh, children who are surfing online as they are learning are not going to go, you know, and surf on other platforms that might, you know, be damaging to them. Yeah, I, I, it's important to for parents to, to monitor their their children, especially mm. the gadgets that they they use, and uh, also important to block certain sites that can lead to to abuse of of children. You know, on the internet, you have uh, uh, predators, you, you have pedophiles, you have people who also want to, to recruit children. Mm -hmm. We also have material that is not safe for, for children. So monitoring is also very important from, from the angle of parents, given that uh, they are with children uh, probably 100% of, of, of their time. And also probably to, to our internet providers, it's also important to ensure that uh, there are certain sites that cannot be, be accessed uh, uh, during this uh, uh, very critical uh, time that we, we do have. If, if they block sites where that provide pornographic material, mm. sites that are harmful to children, it's also very, very important. And, and also educating children. While it's there on internet, they should not provide uh, uh, personal information to anyone whom they, they don't know. They should also avoid communicating with people that they, they do not know. You know, when you give someone information, people can begin to utilize uh, that information and probably take advantage of children and uh, begin to, to abuse them on, online. Mm -hmm. So it's important for parents to be on the guard. It's also important for children to be aware of what to do and what not to do when they are online. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, uh, but when we come back for the second session, we're going to go through to Barbara, who's going to tell us how children with disability are also able to learn using online platforms, whether these services are available in the country, and if not, what are these children doing to ensure that they also get to stay in touch with their uh, syllabus and uh, moving with the rest of the children. So stay locked in and we'll catch you after the break.
Welcome back. This is a live broadcast where we're discussing about children's safety and welfare under COVID-19. Now coming to you, Barbara, just tell us how are children with disability also continuing with their lessons uh, online as is the case with other children who don't have disabilities? Are there platforms where they can go if they cannot see? Are there platforms where they can go if they cannot hear as uh, you're from Diff Zimbabwe Trust? Thank you. Um, children with disabilities are in a, in a very difficult space during this time. Mm. As I said before, um, we have, as a country, not prepared ourselves to provide education for children with disabilities outside of the crisis that we are in. Zimbabwe up to now has not um, rolled out an inclusive education policy. Mm -hmm. And without that policy framework, which guides how provision is done for the different needs of the different children, it becomes very difficult to provide for those children when we are in a crisis, when we are struggling outside a crisis. Mm. And so many children um, with disabilities are struggling. It's very unfortunate that the majority of them are found in the lower socioeconomic um, uh, spaces mm. where access to resources, access to uh, smartphones, access to computers, and then to talk about data and for them to be able to access online classes is actually way out mm -hmm. because the basics are not there, the hardware that's needed. Um, the government has come in to provide radio lessons mm -hmm. and that was launched last week. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it, they're not available for deaf children mm -hmm. and deaf children are not ab able to access radio classes, which means that they're going to be left out of that program of alternative learning. Mm -hmm. um, when you're looking at the radio classes, they've been tailor-made with the child who learns in a particular way. Yeah. But children with disabilities learn differently. Mm -hmm. You spoke about um, visually impaired children. Mm -hmm. uh, think about children with psychosocial disabilities mm -hmm. who learn at a slower pace than others. All that has, has really not been taken into account. Mm -hmm. And so you're looking at, we need to begin to think about how do we make provisions for learners with other needs? How do you make uh, provision for learners who learn differently? Mm -hmm. um, children who are deaf and hard of hearing need a sign language interpreter. Mm -hmm. And that's just it. Mm -hmm. If you give them a teacher and an interpreter, they're able to engage with the curriculum. Just to cut you there, what does this teach us as a nation? Given that we're now in a way reacting to the situation, uh, the COVID-19, the coronavirus pandemic, what if we had already started working on some of these things prior to such uh, issues? What, what are some of the lessons that are coming through and what are some of the solutions to these challenges? W what we learn as a nation, I think, is that to be prepared in times when we have time, when we don't have a crisis, mm -hmm. is the best way to go. And to create a policy framework that guides how we provide um, you know, support to the most vulnerable. Mm. It's, it's very unfortunate that without the policy framework, we are not ready. Mm. And to begin to do piecemeal measures, we still have done that, but we have left the most vulnerable outside the equation. Mm -hmm. So I think as a, as a nation, we need to create the building blocks for provision is policies. Mm. And we have a constitution that makes provisions for this. But yeah. unless this becomes implemented, it will remain on paper. Yeah. You know, sign language is provided for in our constitution. Section 6 provides for that. And various other sections provide for that. Mm -hmm. But until we practice, we, we, we actually implement that, then we are not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So we need to make, you know, true of the promises that are provided for in our constitution. All right. Thank you for that. Reverend. As she's speaking on behalf of children with disability, there's also another vulnerable group, who children in the rural areas. One of the arguments that's been raised in Parliament several times as unions have been engaging with legislatures is the issue to do with accessibility of electricity, accessibility of internet in the rural areas. How bad is the situation now where they cannot go to the schools usually that are many kilometers away from where they stay 
and now they are told they have to learn using uh, radio platforms like she's highlighted and yet they don't have in some areas uh, connectivity what, what's what's the situation prevailing on the ground there it's, it's a challenge I think Barbara has, uh, has made it clear uh, one of the pro problems that we have as a country is that we are not investing enough in education mm. Education should be seen as an investment um, so that it's provided for adequately. Then you'll be able to cover all these groups of people. Uh, for now, um, even if you look at the uh, education vote, mm -hmm. the majority of it is going to salaries. Yeah. For me, that vote should go into infrastructure development rather than salaries. Salaries should be a separate whole unit, not tied to the Ministry of Education and Primary. Mm -hmm. Because when you choose up to 80, 90 percent of that vote, then it means there's very little that you're putting into infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So what Barbara is speaking to is about infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You need to provide that infrastructure the resource, I know the ministry has talked about resource centers, it has talked about uh, um, ensuring that a child with disability lands at the nearest place to her or his home. Mm -hmm. But as we speak, uh, most education for people with disabilities is being provided at boarding school, mm -hmm. which is a much more expensive um, a way of educating them. So we have a challenge there. We need to invest more in, ch in, in, in education. Yeah. But then not only when you invest, you also need to monitor, have enough mechanisms that monitor to ensure that, you know, there is quality education as well okay. to that. So um, we are yet to see when schools open what the ministry will do about the rural child in terms of ensuring that that child receives education. Okay. We are yet, but um, what I find interesting is that there are development partners that are coming together to support Ministry of Education, development partners like the UNDP, the UNICEF, and those are experienced um, UN agencies mm -hmm. that may help in terms of the technical input that is required to ensure that every child has a right and has access to education. All right. But the majority, it has to be the government investing mm -hmm. in children, in its children. All right, coming to you nice and uh, building up on the issue of education, on the, onto the youth now, where are they getting information mm -hmm. regards COVID-19? Because for adults, you know that they're reading the newspapers, you know that they're going to work, some of them, and some of them who have access to online platforms and radio can get that information. What about the youths? What about the children? Where are they getting information? If the schools are closed, where teachers would actually come up with a system to have them be able to digest this information and make mm -hmm. it useful to them? How now, where those teachers are not involved in, the, in their lives, but there's this pandemic they need to be aware of and protect themselves. Yeah, uh, actually it's uh, one of the gray areas um, in terms of access to, to child-friendly information on COVID-19. So it should not be I information, but mm -hmm. child-friendly information that children can actually relate to and can understand mm -hmm. and probably take appropriate actions guided by, by that information. I, I would also point, I, interestingly, you know, a, as the sector, I know with REV and other actors, we were doing a, a child rights and protection assessment. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the uh, worrying aspects is that among around 20,500 and plus children who have participated in that assessment, uh, around 35% said they are receiving uh, child-friendly information, which means around 65% of children mm -hmm. are not accessing information. And if you, you, you dig deep, you'd find that 
this kind of the 65 percent you know these are children mostly in in rural communities mm -hmm. who do not have access to radios who do not have access to newspapers who do not have access to social media platforms where information is mostly being being shared mm -hmm. so there's need to devise strategies that actually reach out to the most marginalized children mm -hmm. in the most uh, marginalized communities with mm -hmm. child-friendly information and this does not require government only I, I understand different civil society different ngos un agencies are, are making efforts to ensure mm -hmm. that information on covid 19 reaches out to to children mm -hmm. but the big question is are we doing enough are we reaching out to to the most marginalized children in the most remote communities of of zimbabwe mm -hmm. so there is need to bring in you know collaborative efforts and ensure that we plug the gaps that exist and reach out to to children and 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 disappointingly is um the assessment also point to some of the myths around the uh, uh, covid 19 and mm. surprisingly there are a lot of myths uh, um, among uh, children and young people mm. and some of them are like the 0 to 15 cannot uh, get infection uh, if you if you get infected, if you sit in, in the sunshine f between 12 and 3, mm -hmm. COVID-19 will go away. If you drink ginger, lemon, mm -hmm. all these are, are myths are, are around mm -hmm. COVID-19. And if uh, we do not provide comprehensive child-friendly information, we are at a risk. Mm -hmm. And also given that we are talking of reopening schools, children going back to school. You know, children are not very careful like adults. Mm -hmm. They can begin to share masks, you know, and it's kind of like very difficult and mm. you'd find that cases will begin to, to increase of infection. So we need to guard against that. We need the collaborative efforts. We need to devise information that can, you know, reach out to children in a child-friendly manner and children can relate to that. Okay, staying with you, Samuel. All these issues you're highlighting, the gaps, 65% is very huge. And all these other things that need to be done require a budget. Yes. And yet government is stretched because not only are they supposed to consider education, they also now need to consider education plus PPEs for the students and the teachers. What measures can be taken by, you know, uh, uh, development partners to ensure that uh, government is also buttressed and things start to move in terms of closing those gaps and ensuring that uh, you know, there's progress in, in terms of child development regards education. Yeah, you, like Rev said earlier, the, the mm. issue of, uh, of investment, you know, is, is very uh, a law and um, uh, there is need for mm. government to prioritize allocation of resources to these emerging child rights concerns mm. and child rights um, issues. You know, development partners and CSOs, they, they come in to complement the efforts of, of government where there are certain gaps. Mm -hmm. So really there's dire need for government to also really look at the kind of investment that is there, the kind of resources that are earmarked to address child rights issues. You know, Rev have spoken to issues of uh, the budget itself, uh, the national budget, if you look at it, more than 85% is going to salaries. So how much resources are actually going to, 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 to programming mm. for development? Very little resources, and it's a very small, small cake. Okay. So we need to ensure that while at least we have a small cake, we are able to prioritize issues relating to children. And also we are able to, you, you know, one of the challenges is that, you know, we're within an emerging situation. Mm. And when we are not, we should be able to come up with emergency preparedness plans mm. and also emergency preparedness budgets that we can tap from in case we have a, an emergency okay. situation. So if we don't have that, then we begin to struggle. Mm. The cake that is earmarked for certain uh, 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 programming activities, those are the resources then that are taken. But if we have a certain cake that we, we budget on yearly basis, even if we do not have an emergency situation, those resources are accumulating. Okay. And we can actually tap from that to support those uh, issues that are emerging. All right, thank you for that. I'm going to go to Barbara now. Children with disabilities require specialized and technical attention. That's why you've got schools like Rubimbo School, uh, where they have uh, models to take care of these children in lockdown where they have parents who don't have these technical expertise how are they coping 
it is very difficult and the issues that Reverend raised about abuse mm. become very rife. Um, children with disabilities are very vulnerable to caregiver abuse. Mm. And it's not something that you would see, but it's shoving you, it's not giving you food, it's um, just neglect. And so in situations of lockdown, the vulnerability increases mm -hmm. because the parents do not have sometimes the patience mm -hmm. to take care of the needs of these children. And so you find that um, the lockdown has actually exacerbated the vulnerability of an already vulnerable child mm -hmm. because the, the home setting is not ready. Many parents of children with disabilities, particularly physical disabilities that require a lot of care and attention, do not have the expertise, may, may send them to schools, but right now they are with them. Sanitary support. Um, some children use um, pampas, they need hygiene sets, mm. and these are not readily available because of the cost, because the parents are n not able to buy them. So the cost of disability itself is quite high and unfortunately in our country because of resource constraints the parent is not given the necessary support that they need for them to be able to give wholesome support to the child okay Th thank you so much for that uh, input i know you will be leaving us as we get into the third segment thank you and hopefully when we come back to this show have a host this show again we'll definitely have solutions because we really want to see how these children can be assisted and thank you so much for your time barbara we're going to take another short commercial break and when we come back we'll continue with the conversation life will never be the same again absolutely no. how do you tell someone in barrier or uh, in uh, in soweto uh, that uh, they should exercise social distancing. Mm. Every single one of us, barring a few, are praying more. What, what is the, yeah. the health economic cost of what we are trying to achieve? I don't know whether his chairman knows he runs at about nine <laughs> in the morning. Yeah, I've, I've just got the symptoms, so I just called the doctor and I just, uh, and then he just advised me to have to stay at home, eh? Where we, we are discussing children's rights under COVID-19. Uh, joining us right now is Cleopatra from Say What. Welcome. Uh -huh. Just give us uh, your, your, your feedback uh, from what you're picking from your interactions with children in society under this uh, COVID-19 uh, era we're, we're living in. Basically, from the conversation we've been having, it's more of mental problems. Young people are anxious, mm -hmm. young people are depressed, young people are people who are very active. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, they spend their time in colleges where they are parent free, I can say. Mm -hmm. They're having the time of their life. So now they're, they're supposed to spend all their time with their parents and locked inside. Mm -hmm. So the main question is every time, when are we going back to school? When are we leaving parents? When, when are we going back to our normal lives? Mm -hmm. So I can say young people are very anxious and they are also thinking about open, reopening their institution. So they're like, when are we going back? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, talking about anxiety, uh, Revia spoke about abuse. If they're already anxious about what's happening and probably there's issues of abuse within their family settings and within the environment they're living in, mm -hmm. how does th that uh, also lead to drug abuse at the end of the day? So uh, we have picked two things. Mm -hmm. So basically it's drug abuse and it's also sexual abuse. Mm. So with young people, most when they are anxious, they will revert back to look for other means where they can have fun mm. when they are still indoors. So we now record a lot of cases of drug abuse and we also record a lot of cases of sexual abuse because mm. most young people are living with their perpetrators. 
right now. Mm -hmm. So like institutions at the safe haven, like said be with the previous speakers, where they can actually report abuse and where abuse can be picked up because they have left the perpetrators and they are in a new environment. So basically, those are some of the, the gray areas. Those are some of the problems due to lockdown. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, Rev, I'm just going to bring you in on the issue of sexual abuse. Uh, but we want to start with uh, the young people being idle and now being exposed to internet where they might see content which will lead some of them to start indulging in sexual activity. How protected are they? Are there any platforms where they are being educated on use of protection if they end up you know, getting involved in sexual activities? The, the Minister of Education has now introduced the sexual and reproductive health mm -hmm. in schools. Yes. Although um, many parents feel otherwise. Mm but uh, it, it has started. So it's an effort to try and get children to understand, you know, their growth or their adolescence, mm -hmm. so to speak. When it comes to universities, I know say what is quite involved in uh, sexual and reproductive health for students. Therefore, they have access to healthy services. I think many universities now have um, those centers that provide sexual and reproductive health services, mm -hmm. not only education, but the services themselves, mm -hmm. right? So there, is, there are those spaces where they can um, get to. But I also know that the Zimbabwe Family Planning Council has youth-friendly uh, centers where young people can actually go and um, get education as well as services on mm -hmm. sexual and reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. So there are those initiatives that are in place. But uh, as a society, we, are still, um, we, we still have problems when it comes to sexual and reproductive health, particularly within the family setup. Not many parents are comfortable speaking to their children on sexual and reproductive health. Mm -hmm. But in the environment that we are in, it's important that we begin to do that because there is no one uh, who can um, educate your child besides yourself because we no longer have that society nana te te wana se kuru and whatever. Mm -hmm. It's about you, the pr parents, being the center of focus for your child development. Okay. All right. Yes. We're going to just go back to you, Cleo, and say you spoke about anxiety, uh, mental health, health issues. Where can these youngsters that are having these issues, where can these youths call in or get help online? Are there any platforms that have been created specifically under this uh, COVID-19 era to assist these uh, young, young people? Thank you so much. So basically, we were reaching young people physically. We're using edutainment. Uh, you know, young people are a diverse group, different from adults. So now, because we have COVID-19, we have created WhatsApp online groups. We have created, uh, we already have a Facebook page where we post content on COVID-19 and on sexual reproductive health. Mm -hmm. But now we have focused on WhatsApp groups, which are online. And we know WhatsApp is friendly to almost all young people. Mm -hmm. So we have created groups where we discuss on sexual reproductive health. Mm -hmm. We discuss on the anxieties. We discuss on different issues. Uh, just of late, we were having uh, conversations where young people were meeting the experts. So we wanted young people to actually meet experts on COVID-19 so they can clear their myths. They can also get information from the experts because we know young people have peer-to-peer -peer information dissemination where they just ask a peer to say any information they would want, they'll get it from their peer. So we wanted to make sure that we clear those myths even when they themselves are having conversations. They'll have quality conversations with correct information. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now joining us uh, live on the line is Nyson, uh, who's just going to be telling us uh, which organization he's coming from and uh, what he's also picking regards uh, the ch children rights that are being affected uh, because of this uh, pandemic and the lockdowns that have been is instituted in the country. Uh, good afternoon Nyson, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon listeners. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for giving us, giving me this opportunity as a representative of Zimbabwe. Uh, early 
Childhood Development Actors, mm -hmm. commonly known as ZINEGDA. Mm -hmm. uh, we represent the interests of the children from conception up to eight years. And as been, I think, pointed out by others, or I might have missed some, is that children are children, and that they would like to express themselves and to learn through play. Mm -hmm. And the play to them is a spondenga, and it is not restricted. And they cite what has come up with uh, COVID-19 and its uh, restraining uh, measures is that children have now been locked up in small spaces. Spaces in terms of the real space where they play, uh, locked in confined spaces in terms of their emotional space, and also in terms of creating relationships which they are supposed to have. And as such, mm -hmm. they have actually also been restricted in actually reaching out to some of their edgements where they can freely roam and play without restriction. And in so play, they are also expressing themselves and expressing their anger and anxiety, which is supposed actually to be ameliorated. Mm -hmm. And in such situations, we have found out that COVID-19 is actually uh, isolating children it is actually also increasing the anger and confusion and the depriving children of their right to play and learn. Mm -hmm. And also what is happening is now the increase in the conflict, whether intentional or unintentional, because of the restrictions between the parents and also the caregivers and the children. It is actually even more aggravated in urban areas where the play spaces are very few and those which were there are being taken for other residential spaces or for others. And that most of even the play spaces which were there were meant for adults rather than for children. Mm -hmm. So in that, the lockdown or the COVID is actually reducing the space of children and which is not good for that. And again, what is happening is that children are spending more of their time with their parents and the family, which is a good thing, but the issue which is there is that the parents are beginning to be parents this time. They have been actually giving the, their role of parenting to ECG centers, but now they've got to spend more time with their children providing them with the needed, provision, uh, needed nutrition and also the safety and health which is required at home. Mm -hmm. You will find even among this, even if they have got the best interest, but because of the lockdown, they are not able actually to give all that they can to children. Okay, so okay. All right. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to cut you short there, uh, Mr. Nyson. But thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, I want to come to you, Samuel, and say one of the issues that uh, Nyson has been speaking about uh, during this uh, call-in session is the issue to do with uh, children failing to exercise their right to play. Some of us, when we grew up, you know, I didn't know it was a right. I thought it was just, you know. Mm -hmm. But now when you are in these situations, you actually begin to understand that it's a right to play. Tamba chikweshe, maflau, and all those other things that we do. I didn't know I was exercising my right. Mm -hmm. How has the issue of urban development, look at most of the, uh, the ghetto areas in, in Harare, for instance. You know that they've now got infills where areas where we used to have uh, soccer grounds, they've now been turned over into residential areas where houses have been constructed. Now we've COVID and now we've got lockdowns. Children cannot play. What needs to be done? 
Yeah, quite quite, quite critical. Yes, the right to play and leisure. It's it's actually a right for mm. for children mm. to to play and play also contributes to 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 positive development of children. Mm -hmm. It also contributes to social learning during play. Children also learn from from others. Unfortunately, we we have seen this uh, right uh, continuously being being violated. You know, it's the mandate mm -hmm. of the local authorities to ensure that play centers, grounds are created, they are maintained mm -hmm. to ensure that children play. You know, they, they learn and skills develop through, through, through play. Unfortunately, we, such spaces are not available and uh, it's difficult during this time for children to also exercise and access their, their right to, to play. Mm -hmm. And um, one key recommendation is to, to ensure that uh, safe spaces are created during uh, this, this time to ensure that children enjoy their, their right to play. I know government and actors can team up and begin to think around creating safer spaces where, you know, all, all other processes in terms of meeting the WHO guidelines, the Ministry of Health and Child Care guidelines to prevent COVID-19, you know, can be adhered to. Mm -hmm. So safer spaces should be created. You know, Rev said uh, COVID-19 is here to stay. We, we don't know where we'll get a vaccine yeah. or a cure for it. Mm -hmm. So we need to devise ways where we can allow children to enjoy their rights fully and in particular the right to play is key and it, it also contributes to, to children being being focused and also moving away from some of the activities you know drug abuse sexual activities that actually put them at at risk mm -hmm. so it's a matter of government teaming up with different actors to create safer spaces for children to access their right to play Okay. Now, because of our time, we need to wrap up. So I'm just going to ask each one of you, starting with you, Cleo, to give us your sentiments, uh, what parents need to do out there to keep their children safe uh, under this uh, COVID-19 era we are now living in. So basically, I think parents need to start having conversations with their children. Mm -hmm. uh, like Rev said, the issue of sexual reproductive health is not a favorable subject to which you can just speak with with your child or with your parent. But I think because of COVID-19, we have to start those conversations and we have to create a safe and uh, friendly environment whereby we can talk about these issues. I'm just thinking uh, where maybe your father would just start saying, let's talk about sex. Mm -hmm. I know it's weird, but it's, it's equally important mm -hmm. for us to have those conversations. Yeah. Mm. Let's, let's converse, let's converse, that's the message. To the man who carries governance on his shoulders, what are your words to society, Althi? Yes, I, I think my other colleagues have um, spoken to the issue of engaging, mm -hmm. creating spaces to discuss COVID-19. Uh, the public broadcaster has to provide those spaces. Mm -hmm. It has an obligation to ensure that people have adequate information. Mm -hmm. And in a society, you have a whole groups of people. You have children, you have uh, adolescents, you have the adults, you have the age. All those groups have a right to information on COVID. Mm -hmm. And that information should be tailor-made or structured for their understanding. Mm -hmm. So engaging society is important mm -hmm. and uh, we need to create these spaces, in including even ZTN. Mm -hmm. It has to create the space for engagement as a corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm because COVID is with us for some time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, when you say ZTN, we listen and you will get the picture. Definitely will give children the space yeah. on this platform. Samuel. <laughs> uh, my concern, uh, lastly, is on child protection. Uh, we have seen an increase of uh, child abuse cases. Mm -hmm. And one of the key recommendations to various actors and, and government is to create, uh, you know, free phones, free lines, in particular for key child protection service providers. I'm looking at the Department of Social Welfare. I'm looking at the Victim Friendly Unity that are key so that children have got a variety of channels or where they can report cases of abuse, where they can also, you know, get counseling online, therapy online to, to address some of the issues they'll be uh, in, encountering. And, and secondly, it's, it's important to continuously, 
you, you know, uh, create uh, content, child-friendly information on COVID-19 that can be uh, shared with, with children, in particular in, in marginalized communities mm. in, in rural areas. I also speak to, to, to sexual reproductive health rights. I'm not a guru in that, but um, you know, we've seen lockdown has created a scenario where it's difficult to access information, to access services, to access resources. So there is need to also devise uh, or come up with innovative ways during lockdown to reach out to you know young people uh, adolescents so that they access services they they access information i'm, I'm thinking of for mobile srhr service provision which which is quite possible during this time so it's a matter of now you know getting out of the box uh, uh, thinking globally uh, thinking innovative and ensure that in whatever that we do we reach out to the most uh, marginalized communities and in particular for me child protection child rights realization remains at the top of the of the priority and uh, also it's important for me to say uh, you know we've got child line hotline if children encounter abuse they can yeah. call the 116 line when where they can get support i know you've spoken to around 95000 mm -hmm. a plus a cause that child line is receiving and there's need for various actors, government and stakeholders to also continue supporting the 116 line that we do have. Mm -hmm. And uh, Plan uh, International Zimbabwe has made efforts to ensure that we, we also support to ensure children have access to reporting and also to key services. Well, thank you so much uh, for all of you for these powerful contributions that you've uh, brought to the fore. I'm sure that our listeners who have been tuning in for the past hour have definitely learned a lot about children's rights and what they need to do to ensure that these rights are not deprived under this COVID-19 era. Uh, we come to come to the end of the show today. We've been uh, discussing children's safety and welfare under COVID-19 uh, in partnership with ZNCWC. This was a critical uh, issue that is uh, simmering in society where children are not the face of the pandemic, but they are indeed suffering in silence. I've been your host, Takuchi Mbakwe. Stay tuned for the next show.